Hello, I'm Father Kenneth Metz, a priest here at All Souls Catholic Church in Sanford, Florida. In this video, I will begin to share with you how the Catholic Church views baptism, the first of what we call the sacraments of initiation. In this series, I will speak first about the meaning of initiation into the church and then look at a deeper understanding of baptism itself. And I'll finish this series with an examination of various discussions about infant baptism, rebaptism, the concept of limbo, and the requirements for a person to be a godparent at a Catholic baptism. Now, there are three sacraments of initiation into the Catholic Church. Baptism, Confirmation, and Eucharist. I've spoken in previous videos on the centrality of the Eucharist in the life of the church, the divine presence of Jesus at Eucharist. And I suspect we know much more about the sacrament of Eucharist than the other two. One reason is because we are able to participate in the Eucharist or Mass every day if we wish, whereas we can receive baptism and confirmation only once in our lifetimes. In order to understand what the church means by the word initiation, we need to step back and look at what sacraments are. You know, the Christian life is a multifaceted encounter with God. Each of us in our personal lives have a beginning, a middle, and an end. We are born, we mature, we sin, we eat, we marry, and we die. And to these natural events of life, God informs our lives with special movements of grace, which we call sacraments. Thus, there is a constant resembling between the stages of natural life and the stages of the spiritual life. That's what they say in the Catholic Catechism. As the Catholic Church understands them, the sacraments are, quote, efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the Church by which divine life is distributed and dispensed to us. That's also in the Catholic Catechism. Now, the word efficacious means that what the sacrament signifies, it also does. A sacrament is not a sign like the stop sign out here on the highway. No, that stop sign doesn't do anything to stop us. We see the sign and we stop the car. A sacrament confers with the grace which we then receive. The sacrament does what it says it does. So when we think about sacraments of initiation, we're talking about the foundational events in Catholic life. Pope Paul VI once wrote, the sharing in the divine nature given to man through the grace of Christ bears a certain likeness to the origin, developments, and nourishing of natural life. The faithful are born anew by baptism, strengthened by the sacrament of confirmation and receive the Eucharist as the food of eternal life. By means of these sacraments of initiation, they thus receive in increasing measure the treasures of the divine life and advance towards the perfection of charity. Now, to get a sense of how this developed, we can look back to the rites of initiation and how they were practiced in the early church. For those people, the most important night of the year was Holy Saturday, the day before Easter. For on that night, those who were becoming Christians entered into the ranks of the faithful. And one way we catch a glimpse of their practices is to look at their church architecture. Now here is a simplified drawing 
of that church, the typical church. On the right here, we have a room with a pool in it, and we have the people standing outside of the, outside of the church, okay? The first room was the baptistry. You notice here, the three steps going in, three steps coming out of the pool. The second room has a chair right here, and that's the room where something else was going to happen. And the third, the big room, is where they have an altar in this, by the circular part, and the, the C's here signify the congregants, the people that are there. Now, all the churches were basically the same, but they had a lot of differences in it, but this is, kind of gives you the idea. Now, knowing the layout of the church building, we can go back to the Easter Vigil sermons of the fathers of the church. Now, these homilies flesh out for us what was happening in these rooms. It's important, I think, to remember that the rites of initiation were not entered into on the spur of the moment. Persons who had already sensed the communion with the commitment to Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior went through a process called the catechumenate, during which the truths or the mysteries of the faith were shared in a progressive manner, little by little by little. And by mysteries, they meant realities revealed by God and entered into, not problems to be solved. And this process sometimes took three or four years. So they were ready for this Easter Vigil service. As once they were properly prepared over that time, the adults were ready to be initiated into the Christian community, the ecclesia, the church, at the Easter Vigil. Now, during the homilies preached before they entered into the church, they were encouraged to open themselves to all God had in store for them. This was not to be a passive experience, but a life-changing event, an exciting event that would change them for the rest of their lives. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, wrote in about the year 200, therefore, you blessed ones, and he's talking to the people outside here, for whom the grace of God is waiting, whom you're first coming up from the pool, that sacred bath, when you spread out your arms for the first time in your mother's house, that is the church, with your brethren, ask your father, ask your Lord for the special gift of inheritance, that development or distribution of charisms which form an additional underlying feature of baptism. Ask, Jesus says, and you will receive. In fact, you have sought and it has been added to you. Hilary of Poitiers, writing about a hundred years later, wrote, we who have been reborn through the sacrament of baptism, experience intense joy, a maximum glorium, he, gaudium, he said, when we feel within us the first steerings of the Holy Spirit. And there, there are many other sermons from this time, and they extolled what was going to happen to the people in their baptism as these catechumens entered into the church. And so what did happen in these rooms? I showed you. Well, the first room contained the pool for baptism. Now, the men did it first, the women were second. But they would do it separately in their own because they're going to get all wet in, their, in this pool. So what they did was they'd walk down into that pool, down in the three steps, they'd kneel down, the water would be poured over them, and they would be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When they were finished with that, they'd get up, walk out of the pool in the other three steps, and immediately put on a white robe, which symbolized their new life in Christ. Then the women did the whole the same thing, the men were waiting for them in the, in the next room, in the second room. 
and then the women finally joined them. Now, that sacrament they received in the first room is called baptism. Now, that's named after the central rite by which was carried out, to baptize. In Greek, it's baptizain, which means to plunge, to immerse. And this, what they were doing is they were plunging into the water, symbolizing the catechumen's burial with Christ's death, from which Jesus rose. And as they came out of that pool, that symbolized their resurrection anew with Jesus. They became the new creation. Now, baptizain is a much oh, more intensive use than the word bapo, which is just to wash. Although washing is important, as Paul pointed out to Timothy, or to Titus, rather, in chapter 3, verse 5. In the second room, they met the bishop, who confirmed them. He anointed them with consecrated oil called sacred chrism. And it was a sign that the person was now a participant in the life of Jesus, who was anointed priest, prophet, and king. For the newly baptized, this was a further strengthening and openness to receive the gifts of the Spirit that Tertullian spoke about, and I had quoted earlier. The third room was the body of the church, the place where they celebrated the Eucharist. According to the practice of the day, the, new the newly baptized would be for the first time allowed to stay for the whole Mass. Before this time, they could stay for the readings, for the sermon, and for the prayer of the faithful. And then they would be dismissed because the mystery of the Eucharist was so important and so central to the body of the church. And their first reception of the Eucharist would be the high point of being initiated into the church. After all their preparation, they were now able to receive their Lord in holy communion. Just amazing, just amazing. What a night this is for those people. Now, throughout the history of the Catholic Church, there were many discussions as to what was the order in which these sacraments were to be given. Time and pressures and all kinds of things changed. And there were questions about when baptism was to be received. Where, should they be received by an infant? Or should it be received later in life? Could a person be rebaptized a second or a third time even? And what are the roles of parents and godparents? And what about limbo? So in the next videos, I will look into these questions. And so until next time, please check out our website at www.allsoulsanford.org, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have a blessed day.